Good morning from Washington, D.C., and welcome to week four uh, of our virtual academic program, Developing Local Strategies to Counter Violent Extremism in Africa. Uh, again, I'm Anwar Bukharis, and Professor of Counterterrorism and Counter Violent Extremism. This is the, the last session of our academic program titled Challenges and Lessons Learned from the Kenyan County Action Plan Model. Idris Lalali, uh, the acting director of the African Union Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism, Kayert, will be moderating today's discussion. Thank you, Anwar. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I know we're all in on different time zones. Uh, it's great to, to be, um, it's a big honor, uh, honestly, to be uh, moderating the last session of this four-week program that we are very pleased to have organized with our, uh, um, I would say, sister organization, ACSS, and, and the brilliant team of, of ACSS of this uh, a program on developing strategies on countering uh, violent extremists. Uh, indeed, today's sessions is on challenges and lessons learned from the Kenyan County uh, Action Plans, what we refer to as the CAP model. Uh, indeed, we have covered considerable um, headway, I would say, and road on this important subject over the course of the last four weeks. If you recall, uh, we, in week one on understanding the rationale for local CVE action plans, we discussed whether and how national strategies align with the nuances of local context and the domestic casual factors associated with violent extremism. Uh, we also uh, explained how local CVE um, action plans can help bridge the divide between national level policy making and the frontline community practitioners that are generally more socioculturally attuned to the community's attributes and dynamics, it's quite sensitive to the communities. I explained how local action plans enable greater local ownership uh, uh, and ensure the building of a bottom-up approach to community resilience. In week two, on uh, designing and drafting uh, a local CVE plan of action, uh, we discussed the key guiding principles in developing CVE action plans, explain the practical uh, processes uh, or process and steps of designing and drafting a local CVE action plan. And we had brilliant speakers who shared with us some of their challenges uh, faced to ensure that local CVE action plans are indeed holistic, inclusive, and implementable. Put a you know a highlighted line under implementable, and then they also shared us some of the critical lessons uh, learned during the implementation process uh, of local CVE action plans. In week three, which was last week, on implementing a local CVE action plan, we discussed how local CVE plans of actions uh, define responsibilities for its implementation. Uh, we explained the different funding streams for local action plans. And then speakers from Kenya, Tunisia, and Nigeria shared some of their common challenges uh, during the implementation of a local uh, action plan and how these challenges can be overcome while recognizing the importance of flexibility and capa ca capacity for adaptation in the implementation of action plan. You know, the idea of uh, one size fits all solution and uh, why it's not uh, really applicable to uh, the development of local action plans. Today's session, uh, challenges and lessons learned from the Kenyan County action plan model. Yes, you can imagine, aims to consolidate the knowledge shared and acquired over the past few weeks. In order to do so, we have lined up two renowned experts in the field with considerable experience. Welcome me in joining our first speaker, Dr. Halkhanu Abdi, warrior, uh, Wario. Uh, he is indeed a warrior. He's been involved in the process of CVE County Action Plans in Kenya for quite some, uh, a great deal. He's a lecturer in religion at the Department of Philosophy, History, and Religion, Egerton University. He's also a senior Volkswagen Foundation Humanities Research Fellow at the same university with a research project that explores the nexus of religious knowledge and de-radicalization strategies in Muslim-majority urban spaces in Kenya. Dr. Wario holds a doc, uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Religion, Islamic Studies, 
from Beirut International Graduate School of African Studies, University of Beirut, which is not in Lebanon as I, I, I read, it is in Germany, and a Bachelor of Education Arts, uh, both from Moi University in Kenya. His research interests include mediation and mediatization of religious knowledge, religious transnationalism, religion and spatiality, religion and security, Islamic reformism in East Africa, emerging trends in Islamic law in Africa, and dynamics of countering violent extremism in the Horn of Africa. Our second speaker today is Ms. Martin Zutin. She is an independent researcher and associate fellow in terrorism and conflict program at RUSI. Currently based in Kenya, she focuses on extremism and radicalization, countering violent extremism, program management and research methodology. She is a Danish anthropologist, a master's of science, and is uh, studying for a PhD in crime and security studies at University College London. Ms. Zuthen is currently working on CVE research projects globally and in the Horn of Africa region, including as an example, providing quality assurance on the CVE arm of a UK funded police reform program as well as, as recently completed a systematic literature review for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, focusing on rehabilitation. Martin is also leading the MNE and research supporting a disengagement program in Mogadishu, Somalia, and working with the International Organization for Migration on new CVE initiatives and research in Iraq. Prior to becoming an independent researcher, Ms. Yuthen, set up and managed the Rusi Kenya. She has over the six years enhanced the Rusi portfolio and provided quality assurance on a number of projects, including the EU funded Strive Horn of Africa a Strive 2 program looking at preventing violent extremism in Kenya. So without further ado, let's just dive into today's session. Let me start with you, Hal Khanu. Kenya has shown remarkable progress in developing innovative strategies to CVE at national and local levels. What is the genesis and the overall objectives of the Kenyan County Action Plans and what are the measures of achieving these objectives? Can you share uh, examples of counties that have achieved these objectives and those which did not? And most probably provide us with some, you know, answers of why haven't they been able to achieve those objectives? So over to you, Halfan. Uh, th thank you so much. I'm extremely glad to be here. Uh, it's such a, a important program that uh, you are training across Africa, and I'm extremely glad to be part of this uh, discussion to share the Kenya's experience. As you all know, Kenya borders Somalia, and uh, Somalia has been without a very stable government since 1991. Since uh, mid of 2000, so there is this rise of a group called Al Shabaab that uh, try to recruit and, and, and even carry uh, cross border attacks from 2007, 2008, 2009 onward to date. And we see also Kenya Defense Force making an incursion in Somalia in October uh, 2011. And thereafter, we've seen a sharp rise in blood extremist uh, activities, especially targeting high end shopping malls in, in Nairobi or in, in northern parts of Kenya. And uh, to start off this genesis, we need to look at how Kenya has tried from the very beginning to develop policy tools to address the problem of terrorism using uh, the so-called counterterrorism measures. So Kenya put in place uh, a number of laws which were negotiated, discussed for a long time, a lot of contestation from Muslim communities about profiling and so on. But finally, we had Prevention of Terrorism Act. And also thereafter, in 2014, uh, security law amendment acts and, and, and again kenya has a quite considerable uh, specialized unit that deals with these issues of terrorism uh, including police and and, and and the defense forces and so on and kenya is also a very strong leading partner uh, in, in in amisom in somalia so we are quite involved in in uh, as a country in in uh, city or counterterrorism measures but finally uh, from 2000 and um, 16 onward, there was a need to have a, a much more discussion around prevention and countering. And I think you've had this discussion before. So in 2016, the government uh, launched a national strategy, uh, which is called National Strategy for Countering Violence Extremism, and which is domiciled in a, in a body called 
National Counterterrorism Center, which is a multi-agency uh, security uh, entity that, that 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 is composed of all 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 kind of security formation. And the main aim of this strategy was how can we prevent counter extremism. And at that moment, the, the discussion remained very much national. And because Kenya is a, a country that has been experimenting with devolution since uh, 2013, after the passing of the constitution, a very progressive constitution in 2010, there was need to have uh, a much more devolved approach to prevention and countering. And, and the whole idea is how can we involve communities as part of the main uh, you know, preventers of, of, of this violence and of recruitment of radicalization that was already going on in a number of areas. So we found uh, counties at the coast. Uh, Kwale is, is a coastal county that borders uh, Indian Ocean and, and Tanzania, being among the first to develop what we refer to in Kenya as the first generation camps. Thereafter, Mombasa, Kilifi, Lamu, Tana River, which are all coastal counties, develop their own county action plans. And then thereafter, the northern counties like Garissa, Wajia, Mandera, Isiolo, Masabit, were among the counties that also were able to develop the so-called first generation. When we talk of devolution, uh, uh, devolving counter environment extremism, we need to see from the perspective of our own devolution structure. What do I mean by this? During this first generation cup making, there was a lot, a lot of lengthy discussion by different stakeholders. And these stakeholders include national government officials who, who govern on behalf of the national government, the county government officials who are part of the devolved structures, different security formation, uh, women, youth, um, special interest groups, uh, and, among others. So the first generation cups, when we look at it, the journey was much more of that of inclusion, that more of participation, that more of lengthy discussion around discussing what does it mean if we need to prevent this. And there was a lot of mirroring of the national strategy in terms of pillars that are in the national strategy. So the national strategy had about 10 or 10, nine or 10 pillars. So most of the first generation cups uh, we had in Kenya you actually copied most of the uh, pillars that were, were, were in the national strategy. So pillars are basically a way of seeing prevention from the perspective of implementation. So if uh, there's gender related activities that need to be addressed, a community, a, a county will say we need a gender pillar and then they will have activities around it. If there's um, law enforcement issues, uh, issues of police profiling, issues of um, addressing uh, strained relation between communities and, 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 the, and the policing service, then the counties will say we also need this, this kind of pillar. So these uh, nine counties at the beginning had a lot of discussion around. So, there was ownership that was built, uh, and development partners were immensely involved at, at this stage. And what we see about this uh, devolution, uh, devolving caps during the first generation, is that uh, the implementation had a, long, a longer period of, uh, of implementation, five, three to five years. And, and, and currently, because we shifted to a new form of uh, cap making, which I will discuss in a few minutes, Currently, most of these CAPs that were first generation have undergone some form of review or undergoing some form of review. So uh, in 2019, January 15th, there was an attack in Nairobi at a shopping complex called uh, Dusit 2. And thereafter, the president, uh, a few months afterward, declared that all the CAPs, all the counties, which are 37 that do not have CAPs at that moment, should de develop their own customized uh, strategies to address the problem of anti extremism. So based on this presidential directive and, and the successes that were seen in the first generation cup, we saw development of what we here in Kenya call rapid cups. So the difference between the rapid cups and the cups that I had discussed earlier is that these had a very shorter period of development. So uh, it depends from uh, one to three weeks or three to four weeks. But again, uh, the, the people who designed, who implemented, who uh, tried to put together a document still followed certain steps that were used in the making of the earlier CAPS, you know, consultation, including multi-stakeholder multi engagement. Uh, and, 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 and what was unique from this new generation CAP was there was uh, a framework that was called Objective Key Result, OKR, that was adopted and which ensured that implementation is much more successful. And like uh, the larger uh, ambitious CAPS that were earlier, earlier, earlier put out, and like again, the other cups that had many pillars, the second generation cup that we saw in Kenya had very few pillars, five to six, most of them, 
and which were largely based by what the lo local communities identified as key things that they can address in their one year uh, implementation plan. And therefore, uh, as, as we speak to this audience across Africa, our understanding of CAP development in Kenya has been that of a process, that of experimentation, that of learning, that of exchange, and, and which therefore allowed for certain form of uh, uh, modification as, 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 as we continue. Uh, then uh, how, how, did, how did this CAP look at in terms of achieving its objective? So there were a couple of things that stood out when we look at how the CAP making uh, process was and how the implementers of the CAP look at it. Pillarization, this development of the idea that we can cluster around certain core issues that we can use for prevention uh, was, was one of the things that, that, that stood out. In, in development of, uh, of the CAP at that moment. And then there's the idea of multi-stakeholder engagement at the county level. So I will discuss, uh, my colleague and I myself will discuss how the CAP structures are, how the implementation structures are. But from the very beginning, there was this engagement of how can we bring as many people as possible into, the, into, into that framework of discussing how to make the CAP itself and how to implement the CAP. And then from the very beginning, there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm, again, uh, both from the government uh, agencies, but also from development partners, whether it is EU, whether it is individual countries in Europe, whether it is uh, US and so on. There was a lot of enthusiasm from uh, a number of international partners that were able to help uh, these counties together with the government agencies that were involved at that moment to put together this, uh, this, this, this um, policy document. And then again, we see uh, the place of consultation being very central from the very beginning of the evolution of this, of uh, evolution of this, uh, of this cap. So there was envisioning steering committee, secretariats, and other other structures for implementation. And then in most of the counties that uh, I, I have mentioned uh, in the first generation cap, and also a number of countries counties in the second generation cap, there are certain anchor civil society organizations that drive the implementation agenda. Let's take the example of uh, Kwale, which is the first county to develop its own county action plan. I was recently in a workshop where they were reviewing their county action plan, and Huria, one of the leading uh, civil society organizations at the coast, is the anchor organization that runs uh, this civil this uh, prevention agenda as 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 the drivers of of, of this uh, implementation also plan. And then similarly, you find the same in Mombasa, other organizations being leading in Lamu. Uh, in uh, in Siolo, in Nakuru. So we find uh, the role of a civil society that already has had experience in peace building, experience in conflict resolution, experience in dealing with core security related issues, uh, being one of the leading uh, anchor of, of this CAP. But CAP itself, as we will discuss, is, uh, is, is implemented both by the national government uh, representatives and the county government representatives. Ideally, it is uh, something that is supposed to be chaired by the county governor, who is an elected official, an elected uh, politician who represents the county itself, and a national government uh, official called county commissioner, who is uh, appointed by the government to run the national government affairs at the county level. And again, we see cascading of activities uh, being done by, by, by various actors at, at, at the level, at, at this level. So I will continue perhaps after my colleague will, will add more on the same. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Halkanu. Uh, Martin, let me revert to you now. Uh, Kenya CAP model has been hailed as a marker of success for more effective and localized prevention programming, but it is impl but its implementation, as as you heard, remains slow. Uh, based on your experience, what is the level of success of the Kenya CAP model? Now, what were the challenges encountered in implementing this model? Over to you, Martin. Thank you. And allow me just to say hi to everyone and thank you for, for having us. I, I saw one of our colleagues was a Africa Center alumni, and I kind of feel I'm also an alumni because we have met and worked together several times. So just appreciate uh, to, to be with you today and, and discuss this important issue. Um, I felt uh, much as I'm much grateful for the kind introduction, I wanted to just mention that <clears throat> the way that I've been involved in the CAPS myself, uh, I'm based here in Mombasa in Kenya, uh, and as I've been involved in various programs, 
we of course have to do our programming within the national strategy so that's always kind of the parameters of any cve work in kenya and at county level i've been supporting programs that are working on implementing the cap so that's how i've been following it and most lately looking at what is the role of uh, police in particular in, in so so and on top of that i suppose just being a, a a person who's based in this space, I've been looking at at uh, CVE in, in Kenya for, for the past 10 years. So as, as Halkano mentioned, all of this started back when the National, uh, the National Council Terrorism Center in 2016. Um, and he also said that it had uh, a number of pillars. I thought maybe it's worthwhile just mentioning those because that gives us an idea of um, of what it's actually all about. So, so the national strategy had a media and online pillar, a psychosocial pillar, a faith-based and ideological pillar, legal and policy, training and capacity building, arts and culture, education and security. And of course, you can see this means that lots of different professionals need to come together in addressing this issue. Um, and the idea, of course, is that those pillars are mutually reinforcing and are, are aimed at building a strong and cohesive community against violent extremism and against, you know, risk of recruitment. Um, and similarly, all of these pillars, as, as Halkano said, like they were often mirrored in the in the county action plans. And as it evolved, people realized that in some locations it might be meaningful to add a pillar. For example, there was a big discussion around gender, um, perhaps also spiked because we had some, some attempted attack carried out by women. So it was realized, okay, we need to have a specific focus on gender issues to understand uh, what's going on in that space. Um, <clears throat> and then, then as, as Alcano mentioned, you know, uh, the process that followed after the national account uh, strategy was to kind of recognize that prevention has to be local uh, because any of these problems start at a very local level. So therefore local strategies are needed. Perhaps what was a little bit less clear was whether the objective was to implement the national strategy at local level or to develop genuine local strategies. Like what's the relationship between the two? I, I, yeah, I would see that as a, as a challenge that has been uh, dealt with over the years. Um, and that brings us to something that I think we'll keep reflecting back on, which is, you know, what is the objective of these strategies? Um, um, because all, all of the actors that are around the table will have different visions of this. So we need to keep discussing what is the actual objective and who's supposed to do that in uh, what in that regard. Um, and as Halkano mentioned, anyone who uh, has been looking at this have to understand the process of the county action plans um, in the context of the administration level in Kenya. So, you know, uh, the local, uh, local uh, the most local administration level is the county. Um, uh, and that ties into this question of, of devolution because Kenya has had this process of decentralization or devolution. However, um, security is not a devolved function. Security is managed by the national security actors and, and essentially overseen, of course, by the president. So when we have a problem like preventing a violent extremism where we acknowledge that you know recruitment and radicalization happens as a local level but the consequence of any potential act is also a national problem that like keeps discussion around uh, is this a um, is it is it a uh, devolved issue um, that can be dealt with at county level or what is the role of the national government in this and that comes up again and again in terms of funding for example who funds it what is the governance structure and and as halkano said that meant that in the governance you would have representatives of both national level uh, the county commissioner um, as well as the 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 county most senior representatives from the governor's office. And these sometimes do not necessarily have the same visions, which can be a very good thing because we, of course, we need to acknowledge all of those different viewpoints and that is how we do better, better prevention. But it, it's something that is required to clarify in the process. Um, and that, of course, also brings to the issue of, of um, is, is it uh, like in all local counties, there's different politics and are different issues that are most pressing. Um, and therefore we have to question ourselves whether terrorism in all counties is, the mo is a very important thing to think about and how do, we, how do we deal with that? Because of course the threat differs from location to location. And that also meant that in, in, 
in the processes of doing the county action plans, as, as Halcano has said, you know, the first generation, um, uh, let's take Mombasa, you know, the second biggest town, um, the, the, the process of doing a county action plan there, you have a very strong civil society, uh, they are clued into the global discussions around violent extremism. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, but you also have competition between the different actors um, at local level, including the civil society actors. Um, and in that conversation of develop, actually the, 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 the first county action plan at local level was developed before uh, the national strategy came out. Um, so, so there was a bit of an iterative process in terms of once the national strategy was launched, then, then what did that mean to the, the local level ones? Um, and that follows of a completely different strategy to, for example, what we saw in Wajir, you know, along the Somali border, uh, because there's different concerns up there, the threat is more um, prominent. Um, or in the western part towards the Ugandan border, again, where the threat is quite different. So the processes and the capabilities of the actors around the table are very different in each location. Um, um, and therefore it also became more adaptable over time. And there was a recognition that it's okay to develop new pillars to take slightly different approaches, but there was still a recognition that there's a need for comparability between counties. So there is this challenge of how do we make it similar enough that we can compare it across all counties, but how do we make it uh, sufficiently specific to local dynamics and take that into account so that it's, uh, it's fully meaningful at a local level and has local ownership. And here, I think it's fair to say, because of some of the Kenyan counties, terrorism is a, is a very, um, they have many other issues also in the security space to deal with that are perhaps more prominent. Um, the understanding around terrorism is, is relatively low. So in the process of developing these CAPs, there was a huge effort to first discuss like, what does this mean? What is terrorism? What is terrorism prevention? Um, so that was a huge effort um, in terms of, of building the awareness and then get to a stage where you can actually do a, a, a strategy around it. So, so the, the stakeholder engagement process that Halcano mentioned was also a capacity building effort. And, and I would say in some places there's probably more needed because uh, this was so new to them. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think with that, let's, let's uh, turn it back to you, Idris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Halkanu, can you describe the process of designing and implementing CVE strategies at national and local levels uh, in Kenya and some of the challenges encountered and how such challenges were overcome? You know, obviously, with providing you know, specific examples, if you have. Thank you. Your microphone. Uh, I did participate in making of one of the county action plans in upper eastern or northern part of Kenya. And uh, the process is largely one of consultative uh, engagement with uh, stakeholders. So often it starts with, uh, I, I, we, we need to make a very clear understanding that the problem of terrorism has always been looked uh, from the perspective of security for a long period. So this devolving county action plan allowed for a better conceptualization of the problem of prevention for the first time. So a lot of stakeholders who came to this discussion on making of the CAPS were quite um, taken back when they were told that there's a role that they can actually play. So as, as, as Martin mentioned, it was much more of capacity building to ensure that these core people who have been gathered together to understand the problem of uh, VE in their own area and also to start making a tool that is uh, anchored either in their own county action uh, laws or, or, or quasi it, it operates in a very gray area in terms of, of, of legal document, had from the very beginning to be sensitized on, on, on what these county action plans mean and what it actually does. So what, what I found fascinating is usually this process started with baselines where uh, consultants will be looked for and they will look at the problem of VE, uh, they will do SWOT, I mean, strength, strength weakness, and, and, and all forms of analysis to understand the problem of VE. And then after this, uh, either the organization that is funding through the National Counterterrorism uh, Center and the local civil society organizations will identify key persons who represent all the key stakeholders who are going to be crucial implementation of the county action plan to come together. And these consultations are often done for weeks or, or depending on whether it was the first uh, uh, 
generation of cups, or if it was the rapid cups for a few days or a or, or, or few weeks. And then this process was often inclusive, was often participatory. And thereafter, this uh, group of individuals will come up with a draft. These drafts will then be subjected to uh, validation, especially at the county level. And then once validation has been approved, then uh, it is done by review by other agencies that may be funding or so. And then thereafter, the county action plans are, are launched. Now, when we have the document itself now, the process now has left from making it to implementing it. And here is the biggest uh, challenge that we've always had uh, here in Kenya. How do we implement the county action plan? One of the strategies that has been put in place in the making of the CAP is to create a body of individuals who are going to act as its secretariat. Ideally, the CAP at the, at the devolved level is implemented by the representative of the national government who is called county commissioner, and the representative of the devolved government who is called a governor. So these governors will uh, delegate responsibilities to those people un under them to form this secretariat. The secretariat is often composed of uh, national government officials, uh, people from the security formations within that county, uh, women, youth, religious leaders, community leaders, um, I don't know whether I've forgotten, civil society organizations, interest, special interest groups like uh, you know, business people and so on and so on, all are brought together under what in, what in, in this uh, CAP framework is called County Engagement Forum or CEFs. This CEF, within the CEF, there's a core group of people who are part of the secretariat that runs the everyday uh, implementation of the CAP. And uh, there's been a lot of teething problem on ownership, of course, that uh, we will keep referring to because uh, to whom does the CAP belong to? Is it to the civil society organization? Is it to the national government? Is it to the devolved government? Or is it co-owned by all these individuals? Because when you give something to two persons or two entities to own it at the same time, there's always the, the problem of one not necessarily looking at it as, as, as particularly important. But what we find fascinating, I think, over time is uh, because the CAP implementation process is centered around the major towns of each of these counties, whether it is Mandera, whether it is Wajia town, whether it's Garissa town, whether it is uh, Lamu, whether it is Mombasa itself or, 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 or other places, they, there's been need to ensure that the sub-county level are also engaged in. So some of the counties experimented with forming sub-county engagement uh, uh, forums like in Isiola and so on. And again, uh, a, a fascinating development again in Kenya in terms of cap designing and implementation is there's been other agencies, uh, including security agencies, that have been uh, uh, thinking of, you know, formulating their own count, uh, their own action plans to address the problem of uh, violent extremism. Because when they look at the cap itself, they do not necessarily see how they can better participate in it. And again, to make the the process of implementation a little bit uh, seamless, each of the pillars in most of the active counties that have very active CAP implementation programs have pillar heads. So two or three individuals who are in charge of implementation of actions related with their own pillar head. Let's say if it is the law enforcement pillar uh, and the county commander of police, say in Mandera, will be part of the pillar heads who will ensure that activities related with that uh, pillar are implemented. If it is education pillar, so the local uh, education officer who is the county education officer or his or her representative is part of the people who run uh, activities related with, with the pillar. So often these secretariats or these structures that have been put in place meets uh, uh, monthly in the counties that are very active. And, and when I'm talking of counties that are active, I'm talking of the counties in northern Kenya and at the coasts and in Nairobi, where the problem of anti-extremism is much more pronounced. And this may not necessarily hold quite a big truth for, let's say, Turkana or uh, West Pokot or, um, or Migori, where the problem of violent extremism has not been quite pronounced. So other counties are still catching up in terms of how to implement uh, the county action plan. And so, and, and, and I think at the moment we may need to reflect on the journey that these CAPs have made say three years down the line, five years down the line. And uh, as I'm, I mentioned, the counties at the coast, the counties in northern parts of Kenya have made quite considerable uh, effort in ensuring that uh, the CAP implementation somehow is, is running quite well. 
but not necessarily in, in the so-called non-traditional region, say Western parts of Kenya, uh, parts of the Rift Valley that do not have the problem of recruitment and radicalization. And again, what we saw uh, five years going in, in some of the places that there's a uptake uh, dependent, which is very much depending on active presence of civil, civil society organizations who are already involved in some form of uh, peace building programming. So if counties that have very strong civil society culture, these, these CSOs will largely be able to lead the discussion around CAPS, which makes implementation uh, quite seamless in, in a way. But then again, 2020 and parts of 2021, there's been quite disruption of, of CAP implementation, largely because of uh, COVID-19 and, and government put very strong, uh, stringent health and uh, safety measures, which, which did not allow for mobility, for instance, which did not allow for gathering of people above certain number, which do not allow for, for, for a lot of uh, mingling of stakeholders that are often involved in, uh, in, in, in camp implementation, and, and also research around, around the issue of CV. And one of the core issues I think that have uh, also mentioned by, by Martin is the question of implement, uh, evaluation. It's a very crucial question because how do we know uh, we've made progress in terms of addressing the problem of BE? So there's been experimentation around this, and, uh, Though each of the county action plans have very strong, well-articulated uh, M&E framework, uh, they will say, we will implement these. These are the targets. This is our, our end product. This is how we will know we've achieved that. But often, uh, this has not been a, a very seamless uh, process of uh, measuring what the county set out to do. So the national government, for instance, have been uh, experimenting with, with some form of m &E framework that allows real-time uh, evaluation of the CAPS across the country. So the National Counterterrorism Center created something called Fusion m &E system, which if a county like Isiolo is doing something, it can continuously update its own uh, side of uh, the m &E framework so that the national government uh, coordinating body can see which progress is being made where and what kind of effort may be required. By, by, by this county or county B in terms of addressing the shortfall in that. But at the moment, I, I can mention that most of these are quite uh, at the process of, uh, of, of envisioning and, and, and work in progress. So we, we may see uh, better better way of measuring uh, in years to come, but at the same time, one can say that already something in, is in place in order to, to articulate something around m and &E. And uh, it's important that for CAPS to make sense counties to do a lot of effort as a government. And so we found some of the counties in Kenya having departments or directorates specializing in matters of uh, CV. Take Mombasa, for instance. It has a directorate of uh, CV with a director in charge. And so activities that are done by the county government, which are everyday activities that the county government will do, let's say build a market, uh, you know, retamak a, a road, address the problem of youth, uh, drug abuse, uh, build peace between communities and so on and so on, which are all activities if, are main, if which, which, which activity, all these activities somehow fall within the perspective of prevention because they in a way address the core drivers that, 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 that uh, predisposes youth to, to, to the problem of extremism. So they are able to mainstream some of their activities as part of the CV uh, programming. And so, so some, day, some, some counties have made considerable efforts to ensure that there is an entrenchment of the CVE as a programming within their own uh, county um, integrated development plans. Uh, others have passed laws that give uh, more strength to their own CAPs so that CAPs can have budgetary items allocated to them. Or there's, a, there's, there's much more structural support within the counties itself to ensure that the CAP implementation is done. So for instance, Nairobi recently uh, was discussing how to pass a bill on CV, which is going to give strength to its own, its own cap implementation. And of course, there's a lot of debate around this because often this is also looked at by religious communities as a, another way of, uh, of, of, of intruding to people's private spaces or profiling and so on. But uh, the larger discussion is how can we entrench these documents in a much more uh, better way for it to have a lasting uh, impression on the people. So. As I, again, I mentioned earlier, most of the first generation CAPS have undergone this uh, objective key result model review. So we see Kwale, we see Kilifi, we see Siolo, 
now implementing the one year uh, strategic uh, plan, which allows for them to still use their larger document, but now have it cut into one year implementation structures for it to be able to make much more sense and for it to be easy to implement and for it to be sustainably uh, implemented. And I, I think we again see in Kenya something that uh, of, of recent parties is, is becoming a, a quite a common practice where, where development partners are bringing counties together so that they can exchange their own lessons of implementation of their local CAPS. Say Mombasa, Kilifi, Kwale, we sit together and look at what are you, what are you people doing? How are you doing it differently? What challenges are you facing? How are you finding solutions? So this allows for these core people who are involved in the CAP implementation to try to learn from others and try to implement their activities when they go back home in a different way. Again, the national government has also tried to rope in the governors much more. So whenever there is governors uh, forums, you will find uh, forums that are organized especially to discuss issues of uh, CAP implementation and, and, and to ensure that CV issues are much more mainstream as part of county government uh, interventions at, 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 at the level of, of, uh, of the counties. And again, when we say CAP implementation, we need to see it from a very broad perspective. So often the interventions that we are talking about are quite varied. So it could be uh, you know, counter-narrative production, it could be uh, providing economic opportunities for youth, it could be capacity development, it could be something to do with online training on, 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 uh, on how to avoid uh, radical materials online, it could be support for uh, VE victims, it could be disengagement, uh, radicalization, rehabilitation program. So when in Kenya we, we, we are talking about CAP implementation, it's quite a big basket of activities that are quite varied. And a lot of actors are involved from a wide range of uh, positionalities. So this, I think, gives a, a, a kind of overview of, 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 of our progress so far. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, uh, Halkano. Thank you very much. Quite, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. And I've been taking notes. And at the end of this uh, session, I'll try to just highlight some of the keywords uh, that you've used and the ones that Martin have used. Martin, uh, you've heard so many of the challenges that were presented by Khalkhanu. How do you successfully deal with problems such as lack of trust, lack of resources, capacity and expertise, and also reluctance of the national government to relinqu relinquish control over what they perceive to be national security concerns, uh, offering few opportunities for city leaders and practitioners to contribute to national PCV policy or program formulation? Yeah. Um, well, I think I think uh, there's still the issue of of needing to identify, you know, a common ground and being aware of all of the the varied interests of of people that are coming together in this. Halkano talked about the the stakeholder engagement process, and I think uh, if other people were to do county action plans, it's worthwhile being a bit more specific around, you know what is the role and objectives by international donors? What are they bringing to the table and why are they interested in certain areas or certain locations, uh, certain agendas? Similarly with the civil society actors that are of a varied capacity, but what is their objective? What are they trying to achieve? The facilitators of the process, what's their agenda? The national government, the security structures, the county government to kind of map out what are the interests of all of these people so that you can find a, a, a mutual space of, of figuring out, you know, with this in mind, where is the common ground? Because um, I think to an extent, rushing towards a paper, a document, a strategy is not really what you want to achieve. Like the, 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 the goal is the journey rather than the actual paper. Um, because the whole point is to try and get actors that are not necessarily used to working together to, to, to come together and collaborate on this problem or difficult issue. Um, and, and of course, a part of that will always be to, to secure and, and specify where funding is going to come from, whether it's domestic or international and, and what's the limitations with either of those funding streams. Um, and here I think uh, violent extremism, as I can see many of our colleagues are also discussing in the chat box, it's um, it's within communities and it's uh, it's manifesting itself uh, within normal local issues. Um, so we have to think about county action plans as something that has to be embedded into other local priorities um, uh, rather than making it something external. Um, 
because it's not a, 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 a standalone matter. It has to be integrated into other crime prevention uh, uh, issues at, at community level. And therefore, I think some of the issues that perhaps is worth emphasizing also is that um, there are so many actors um, that on a day-to-day -day basis is, is uh, contributing to prevention terrorism at a local level. And therefore, in the processes of having CAPS, we probably need to, you know, keep it a bit more real to, to say it in that way. Like we need the professionals in the room. We need the, the, um, the teachers. We need the prison officers who's dealing with radicalization in the prisons. We need the, um, the nurses who might be seeing something at community level. Those who are involved in, in this issue on a, on a day to day basis and then think about, OK, how do they normally deal with prevention issues and how can we then add violent extremism into that um, conversation uh, so that this problem can be linked to all the other prevention avenues. This also would help us when we think about uh, locations where terrorism is a bigger threat than it is in other locations, um, linking it to general crime prevention, then we have an avenue for having these conversations and, and we always have the space to, to make it relevant. That is the way I think that we can be successful and sustainable, like rather than making it as something external, integrated in general crime prevention. And if there's a problem of general crime prevention, and there is in some counties in Kenya because of, of poverty issues and, and poor structures, but if we invest in, in general crime prevention, cops an additional matter that we can integrate into those, and then it becomes a part of the daily work. So, so in the future conversations around county action plans and strategies, we need more of the actual practitioners you know civil society and and policy makers they are very good at writing documents but they're not necessarily the ones who are out there having these difficult conversations and we do, if we don't have you know people who are doing this work on a day-to-day -day basis as a part of the conversation and understand what are the real challenges they are facing when they are trying to do their work then it will you know be nice documents but not necessarily be translated into to to um, practice and reality and that will allow us again to, to be flexible enough to understand the local needs and, and um, make them specific to, to those additional um, issues. So, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Halkanu, just one last, question, one last question from your end, if uh, you, you, you can be patient with us. Knowing that Kenya has its own unique situation with variation across its counties, as you presented, and local governments, can you share some of the key lessons that could be learned from the Kenyan experience in its CVE strategies uh, at national and local levels? Okay, uh, and, and here I will reiterate some of the points that were mentioned by, by, by um, Martin. And uh, anybody who wants to implement the county action plan, they need to also avoid some of the core issues that we are facing, which I think any programming issues will face. So. How can we ensure that there's sustainability in terms of development of the county action plan and its implementation? So uh, we need to have a, a struck a balance between uh, reliance on uh, development partners and uh, other, other, other agencies to have local driven solution to the problem of VE. So, so, so much so that uh, it's not often captured by the people who know how to do programming and not necessarily how to do the implementation. And then again, counties differ. So in Kenya, the problem of VE is faced differently in different parts of Kenya. It's existential for people in Mandera, but it is something that is often heard of in the news in Kajiado. It's something that occurs, uh, the people know of their neighbor or their sons or their daughters or someone they know who have joined VE, say in Kuala, but someone in West Pokot have their own security concerns that are not necessarily related with V at all. You know, there's arms, there's conflict between pastoralists and so on and so on. So how do we ensure that the doc document we have really uh, addresses the problem of um, violent extremism in that specific area? So this is something that uh, Kenya has been experimenting on and I think we still have some way to go in terms of that. Resourcing is a very core issue that uh, one needs to talk about in terms of our own experience here and lesson that we learn. Can, there be budgetary allocation much more at the county level and the national level to support implementation of this county action plan, or can government uh, uh, look at implementation of prevention itself from a whole different perspective rather than it from the perspective of preventing terrorism because it exceptionalizes 
uh, a problem that, uh, that that can be addressed, say, as, as Martin has mentioned, through existing criminal uh, uh, justice system and so on and so on. So then one needs also to avoid centralizing the cap itself in major urban, urban, urban centers. So if you have a county action plan that doesn't go beyond the confine of, of, of the towns that are the county headquarters, then we may face a lot of problem in terms of, uh, of implementation because the problem of vehicle will be occurring on the fringe or, or the borders of the county. And, and some of the counties border actually international, uh, international borders. So, 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 so therefore, it must be seen as something that it should be able to reach people even at the grassroots level. Then capacities of people who are involved in implementation is something that needs to be looked at from the very beginning because the problem is something that is continuously changing and uh, it's also securitized in a, in a big way. So how can we ensure that people who are involved in its implementation have adequate understanding of the core problem that they are dealing with? Or are they coming with the perspective from their own, say, government agencies or civil, civil society organization or the problem that they are trying to address? Then integrating the cap within existing county legal system or development plans may be able to be one of the ways to desecuritize the cap and to make it part of development agenda. So prevention, say providing employment to a youth is something that is important both for the national government and the county government. And this absolutely had nothing to do with their own vulnerability because it's the responsibility of these uh, entities to ensure that people are secure, people have uh, adequate housing, people have education, people have ability to go around without being discriminated because of their religion or so, or, or, or being attacked and so on. So if this is looked at from the perspective of development approach, then we might have much more uh, increased uh, um, success in terms of that. And then how do we measure success is, is particularly important that uh, question because the interventions in Kenya we've mentioned have been going on say for the last five, six years, and we are yet grappling with how to deal with that. And I think, uh, the problem of cap implementation cannot be divorced from prevalence of other forms of uh, grievances that may still push or pull individuals towards uh, violent extremism. Say, if, if, if extrajudicial killings are still common, if profiling, official or unofficial, enforced disappearance or perception of it, or if attacks by violent extremist groups are still something that is experienced, say in northern parts of Kenya or in, in, in the Lamu region, still the implementation will, you know, the, the, the success that you make is still um, deroded by, by, by other factors that may still make the problem exist. And so in terms of, 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 of these lessons that we could share here in Kenya is, yes, Kenya has made uh, considerable uh, progress in sensitizing the public about prevention and involvement of various stakeholders in CVE, uh, activities. This is something that if we reflect, say, six, seven years back, we can see some considerable uh, effort being made. And again, something that we, 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 we looked at in terms of something positive is a lot of people have been involved. So this multi-sector, multi-stakeholder multi engagement has brought uh, synergy between different actors. Between And again, it has allowed for resources and capacities to be brought together. And somehow, still, we, we are making progress, but this is something that we can look at back and say, well, now a lot of people can talk about uh, uh, violent extremism uh, than, 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 than before. If you look at, say, places like Mombasa, uh, before the cap making, before the national strategy was launched, the jihadi ideologues had free hand to threaten people. If you, talk, if you even use the mosque platform, to discuss the problem of violent extremism. In the evening, you will get a, a call or you will be you know, threatened and so on and so on. So what this cap making, what the lesson that we think we can see is there's be much more open space for people to discuss this VE issue in public than before. And therefore, uh, we see recruit, recruitment used to be done quite open, used to be done quite in you know, ordinary spaces like uh, religious institutions, you know, uh, marketplaces and so on and so on. We find now recruiters and people who engage in and, and the issues either to use online platform that allows for anonymity and other forms of, uh, uh, you know, confidentiality between them. Then where these things were circulated before and, 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 and people are now quite much careful. They know that uh, 
engagement in this may result in, in, in jail and so on. And so one other aspect I think that has been uh, mentioned again and again is this aspect of mainstreaming. How can we ensure that activities that are either done by the national government, by the county government, or interventions that are done by various stakeholders, especially the civil society organization, be mainstream as part of, uh, you know, part of the activities that are related with, with cap implementation. And, and, and there's a lot of discussion around this because this will allow for some form of sustainability. It will also allow for some better way of monitoring and evaluating efforts that are being made. But above all, I think our experience in Kenya should give other people a lesson about continuous learning. Uh, and, and that cap making is a form of experimentation that goes on continuous. It's a work in progress that allows for actors at the local level to see how best to address the problem of non extremism. But it's not something that, is, uh, that, that, that we've done it so successfully that it, it, it might be replicated uh, one for one as it, as it is now. But it's something that uh, various sectors in Kenya are continuously learning along the way and experimenting with different forms of interventions, different forms of, uh, of, of, of conceptualization along the way. But by and large, uh, this experimentation, this learning has allowed for concrete discussion around prevention by, 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 by very crucial uh, stakeholders in most of the counties in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elkanu. Martin, one last question um, to you. What are the lessons learned from the Kenya experience that can assist other countries uh, interested in their developing uh, their own local CVE action plans? Yeah, great. No, I think, uh, Elkanu, you said it so nicely that, you know, more than anything, it has been a continued learning. Uh, Kenya was very strategic and realized very quickly that it was a it's a meaningful way of engaging on this issue and has learned a lot and and in that way uh, i suppose other countries will also face the obstacles but at least our experience has has shown uh, how some of those could be overcome um, and as i've said like i think uh, we have to keep looking back at what is the objective um, because as, as Elkan was saying looking at what are we actually trying to achieve will help us understand you know, what does success look like? How can we break it down? Okay, we all know that the ultimate success, of course, is to try and, and respond to the threat of violent extremism and the risk of radicalization and recruitment better. But breaking that down and looking at the efforts that the county action plan has done, you know, if that means that improved collaboration, do we have some signs that that new actors are coming together and discussing this issue and are actually learning from each other? You know, do we have more um, teachers talking to religious leaders to understand uh, some common ground or do we have uh, prison officers talking to uh, family members or, or nurses or whatever so that we have this idea of realizing that in order to, to do a prevention comprehensively at local level we need all of these different actors to come together and this of course is in a in an infrastructure setup where where there's limited resources and it's difficult. There's so many problems um, uh, that means that there's a lot of demand on, on professional actors' time. So it's you know this is to try and focus their attention to to this issue and that is something we can monitor, right? So that that could be you know one indicator of of, of success. Um, and I think as I was saying before, another lesson as I see it is to recognize that actually. The paper, the strategy, the written document is not the end goal. The, 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 the process of collaboration and recognizing that all other actors have an equally important, however different, role in solving these issues. And sometimes that can be the challenge between security agencies and, and, and governance structures or uh, you know, non-civilian actors, teachers, religious leaders, and so on. We need all these actors to come together in order to be able to do uh, prevention better. Um, and that perhaps leads to that issue of, of ownership. Um, but I think if, if there's a clear understanding of, of everybody's responsibilities, then the ownership perhaps also becomes a little bit is, uh, easier and that will help articulate the governance that is needed. Maybe a secretariat is a way, but I, I actually think um, having uh, people who are doing the practical work on a day-to-day -day basis, they must be a part of the governance process. Maybe 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 there has to be actors who facilitates the meeting and so on, but but making sure that they are there and they are part of the governing structures that that must be essential. Um, 
Um, and then another lesson I think is to, to have this conversation around is PCV or terrorism prevention relevant in all people's lives and should it be because you know we can put too much emphasis on emphasis on that but actually you know lives are much more complicated and in, in not in all places is this equally relevant so so of course uh, how a strategy should look must depend on the threat in that particular county it must depend on the capabilities of the people who are responding it must depend on on, on who are the actors involved? Is it a recruitment prob problem? Is it an active combat situation? Or like who, who is involved at local level and therefore who must be in the room when we discuss uh, prevention? And some strategies, maybe their objective should not be to address recruitment. Maybe it should be to prevent future recruitment or it should be to raise awareness if people see something in a, in a place where terrorism is not an issue. So that also means that uh, the frequency of meetings, the governance becomes entirely different. Having the same setup for all would not make sense if the threat is not similar. Um, and I think another lesson is that it's really key to identify local evidence of what the problems are. Here, the security system, of course, offers great analysis and helps everybody else to understand, okay, what is the problem here? Um, and, and doing a, a good and thorough analysis um, is really important. And here, I think the challenge is that county level is the local, lo most local governing body, but counties are huge. When we look at how many places that could be a, a cell that leads on recruitment, it could be very diverse. And as Alcano was saying, you know, urban versus rural and all of this, like counties are huge places. So, so again, we would need help with local professionals to understand and zoom in and narrow in on where is the actual uh, problem. Um, and I would say again, another lesson, uh, maybe less so from the Kenyan example, but in the global space is to tie this work up to, to other prevention efforts, like how are the communities dealing with crime, with gang issues, with prison radicalization, with hate speech, with ethnic tensions, uh, religious tension, you know, related conflict issues and tensions that uh, we know that violent extremist actors might be taking advantage of, because the way that terrorism and, and um, these activities manifest itself is like as criminal activities, you know, illegal possession of firearm, illegal possession of, of uh, criminal material, whatever it might be, but that's, that's how it would look at a practical level. So by integrated into the, the, the other crime prevention efforts, that's how we can make it sustainable, that's how we can make it real and, and specific. Um, and that of course relates also to who needs to be in the room um, I know we have many, many colleagues who have perhaps military background in this forum. Uh, in Kenya, that would be meaningful in the places where the army is deployed. So, of course, you know, along the border where there's, um, uh, uh, the forces play a key role in managing these issues, they must be in, as a part of the conversation. But there's other parts of the country where the military would pay a, play a much smaller role because it's still a, a, the, pro the problem is minimal. And there it's probably a lot more, uh, you know, civilian actors who needs to be involved. So, so really having the right profession in the room in the right locations is, is important. Um, um, and then as Halkano was saying, I think uh, county action plans or, or devolved terrorism prevention frameworks are really important, but it is not the only uh, avenue. As Halkano was saying, we have all of the other agencies that are also developing strategy. You know, the police have their own strategy. The prisons have their own strategy. So let us not try and do too much and build too much uh, expectations into the county action plans that's recognized that, that they are part of the puzzle that brings in the conversation around how to involve local communities and recognize, you know, it can't solve it all, but it's, it's that aspect into the problem that, that is a key part of the, the, the solution. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martin. I, I like, like to, uh, you know, to seize this opportunity to thank both of you for this very insightful and uh, very informative uh, session. And I think this brings it home. <laughs> Basically, this really, you know, has brought, um, I would say, to, uh, to, to a more practical level, uh, you know, the discussions we've been having at the, you know, throughout the three weeks. Um, and this has really shown some of the, you know, at least some of the challenges, some of the lessons learned uh, from the Kenyan perspective. And then, you know, a number of keywords have came out, uh, come out, sorry, from, from this discussion. Um, quite interesting. Um, you know, I would not 
be pretentious to try to summarize the whole discussion, but I will just focus on keywords. Ownership, developing partners, evolution, review process, need to customize action plans, objective key results, OKR, consultation, steering committee, secretariat, anchor organizations that drive implementation at local level, even if they are civil society organizations, uh, and their uh, role and identification is based on experience. The word professionals, practitioners have, kept, have come from both presenters on numerous uh, occasions. A cascaded down actions from national to, uh, to local, uh, but also local to national in terms of information, in terms of needs, in terms of identification of challenges, but also of required resources. Mutual reinforcement in terms of pillars, actions. Uh, prevention is, starts at local, and I like that, you know, and I agree with you that the prevention should start locally. Uh, local implementation versus local development. So are we looking at lo locally only in terms of implementing the plans of actions or are we developing the plan of actions locally? That's something that we have to think about when we're developing the CBE action plans. Funding, sustainability, budgetary allocations are some of the issues that came again. Governance structures are quite important. Process and capabilities uh, of actors, building awareness, stakeholder engagement process, meaning capacity building of those actors that have a role to play from the design to the implementation, to the evaluation and monitoring of the plan of actions. Um, evaluation process, how do we measure success? So the development and identification of key indicators. And I like the idea about setting the objectives. What are we trying to achieve ultimately? And, and I think that's your benchmark. So if we reach that point, it means that we have at least identified a key indicator among which uh, or against which we can measure whether we're successful or not. Exchange lessons, and I like the idea of this community or county forum that enables the different counties to exchange lessons learned and best practices. And I think it's quite important in that sense, as you both indicated that Countries are at different levels of the threat, but also at different levels of identifying and uh, capabilities, sorry. Clear role and objectives of uh, stakeholders, including donors uh, and foreign uh, development partners, you know, what is their interest ultimately? Mapping out the stakeholders and interest in that sense. Coming together and cooperating also is a key word that came out of the discussion. How do we come together from local to uh, county to national level to work together? Responsibility of security as being a collective security, uh, I would say responsibility or collective uh, responsibility. Investing in other crime prevention programs and issues, which enables you to you know, ensure that many of the actions are indeed sustained, but also build on existing programs, existing budgets, existing capacities. Um, actual practitioners, again, are professionals, sustainability, local driven solutions, multi stakeholder engagement, and to remember ultimately that it is indeed a continuous development program or continuous development process means that we always have to go back, review, identify, define, set priorities, identify key measures or uh, objectives, and then even review uh, you know, the actors and stakeholders that will be involved at uh, each level. So I thank you both. I hope I render justice at least to, uh, to your, um, <laughs> I would say, discussion and, and summarize and picked up on the key, key, keywords that we need to, uh, to, to walk away with.